Presented by Caltech. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm John Grotzinger, uh, Chair of the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences, and it is my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Woody Fisher, one of our colleagues in, in GPS just recently tenured. Uh, Woody received his undergraduate degree from Colorado College in 2000. He got a PhD from Harvard in 2007. He then came to Caltech and did a postdoc for two years, and then we decided that we absolutely had to hire him. And he's been here ever since, and uh, it's been great working with Woody. The topic that he is gonna talk about tonight, photosynthesis, is, is basically the process by which all the oxygen that we have available on Earth in significant quantities enables us to live as humans. It, frankly, enables all animals to live. And without oxygen, we would not likely have had higher life on Earth. So there are these two great questions that, that scientists like to ask. Uh, are we alone? Where do we come from? It turns out that oxygen is actually really important in both of them. Woody is gonna focus on the where do we come from part, and it's a, it's a great question because where we come from is deeply rooted in the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis. And this is something that happened a long time ago in Earth history, and the remarkable thing about it is if we can figure that problem out, what triggered this uh, biological response to produce oxygen and allow the evolution of, of higher organisms as a consequence, it might actually help enable ultimately the question of are we alone? Because those of you that are familiar with uh, exoplanet research, if we were to look at this planet from another solar system, you would be able to detect its sort of first order properties, its mass, its size, its density. And if you were really lucky, you'd be able to see the atmosphere. And so the atmosphere, the composition of the Earth is dominated by oxygen. And if you saw oxygen, you really might have a sense that there might be something else out there. So this is a big problem for us. It's a complicated one. What Woody brings to bear on it is a remarkable set of skills. He was trained as a geologist. He went to Harvard and learned microbiology, biology. He learned organic chemistry. He learned more geology. You have to, go know, you have to know where to go to find the rocks, and he's really good at that. And so you need to bring all these things together to ask this very important question that happened a long time ago, which is basically a problem in history. You have to look back into the seeds of time to basically see where the answers are. And that's what Woody's going to tell us about tonight. So without any further ado, I introduce Woody. Thanks, John, for that introduction, and, and thanks to the Watson Organizing Committee for the opportunity to speak in front of you tonight. Now, it's easy to take for granted the air that we breathe. Everyone take a deep breath. Our atmosphere today is about 21% by volume oxygen, but the geologic record shows us that that wasn't always the case. And in fact, all the oxygen we breathe in the atmosphere is a consequence of an evolutionary event, a singular event that occurred about two and a half billion years ago. And the organisms that are responsible for all the oxygen that we breathe are a group of organisms called cyanobacteria. They are, in many ways, planetary engineers. They are responsible in some way for the product that you see here. And what I want to do tonight is walk you through how we're trying to understand where cyanobacteria came from and how and why they invented this, this, this radical new metabolism. So now cyanobacteria, they're the group that invented what we call oxygenic photosynthesis. And, and I'll, I'll mention uh, the, the modifier there in, in a couple slides. Oxygenic photosynthesis is simply the most important bioenergetic innovation in the history of life. It really transformed our planet. It dramatically increased gross primary production and transformed all the biogeochemical cycles, the sulfur cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the iron cycle, all of these notice. In turn, the production of oxygen catalyzed tremendous biological change. 
shaping novel metabolisms and biosynthetic pathways. And ultimately, this is what's behind much of the richness that we associate with modern biology. As John mentioned, abundant atmospheric oxygen now shapes part of our search image for life on planets outside of our solar system. And finally, the process that is involved in oxygenic photosynthesis, namely that is water splitting, we'll come back to that, this is really some of the most challenging chemistry that occurs on the surface of our planet. And there is a rapid, gro rapidly growing effort in using mechanistic knowledge of how oxygenic photosynthesis works to develop solar fuels to help meet society's energy demands. Now, I mentioned that oxygenic photosynthesis evolved once. That means we can ask questions about what the Earth looked like when it evolved. What did the oceans look like? What, were the, what was biology at that time? The way that we're going to do that is we're going to interrogate two different archives. The sedimentary record, and then we'll in, integrate another one uh, in, that I refer to as comparative biology. Now, comparative biology is effectively asking a question about Earth history, but by comparing organisms that are alive today. Now, there is a record of, that, of the history of our planet recorded in our genes. So much like we have, how we might ask a question about the evolution of limbs by comparing our genes with those of fish, we might ask the same question about the evolution of photosynthesis by comparing the genes of cyanobacteria and other organisms that they are closely related to. Now, these two records, the sedimentary record, actually interrogating the rocks and compared to biology, they have different strengths and weaknesses. Now, compared to biology, for example, it, le it lends a lot of mechanistic detail, and it allows rigorous hypothesis testing. But it can only help ordinate evolutionary events in relative time, and it's totally blind to extinction. We can only work with the organisms that are living today. The sedimentary record, on the other hand, has some challenges associated with getting an accurate picture of what the Earth used to look like from sedimentary rocks. And it can only really paint metabolic processes in broad and coarse brush strokes. The idea, though, is that we can bring these two different records together and actually arrive at a more accurate understanding of some of these important evolutionary processes. Now, what I want to do is start here with just a little bit of background, some systematics background. I'm going to show you tonight some evolutionary trees. Now, evolutionary trees are valuable ways for us to depict the evolutionary relationships between organisms. And, and these are much like the trees that you might use to convey, say, for example, your family's history. Now, the first term that I want to mention, so, well, here we have an, an evolutionary tree with a number of taxa on it. And the first term that I want to introduce is a clade. These are taxa that share a recent common ancestor. You might call them monophyletic, or, mo or use the term monophyly. They form a branch on the tree. So here, taxon three, four, and five, they all form a branch on the tree, and they form a clade. Likewise, taxon three and four, they form a branch on the tree, and they form a clade. Taxon two and three here, they do not form a branch on the tree. They do not share a recent common ancestor because they leave out taxa four and five. OK, so they are not a clade. Now, what we do with phylogenetic trees is we like to paint information on top of them. The phylogenetic tree gives some history of the, of, of the organisms that are on the tree. And we might paint the traits that those organisms have to try to infer something about where those traits came from. Here is an example of what you might call a synapomorphy. This is a shared derived character. In this case, clade three, four, or uh, the clade three, four, and five here, they all share photosynthesis. Okay, that means photosynthesis evolved once in the history of that clade, in the last common ancestor, and, and was inherited vertically. Now, there is an, another really important evolutionary mechanic at play, especially when we start talking about the evolutionary history of microbes. And this is something called lateral or horizontal gene transfer. What you're looking at here is an event in the history of this clade, after photosynthesis evolved, where those genes for photosynthesis were sent all the way over horizontally to taxon six. Okay? 
This serves to complicate some of this evolutionary history, but as we'll see in a little bit, lateral gene transfer is actually an incredibly important mechanism for moving genes around between microbes. It's actually an incredibly important mechanism for understanding the history of photosynthesis. Now, everyone probably has some broad idea of photosynthesis in that you spent some time around plants. When we look at oxygenic photosynthetic organisms, we're left with three groups, the plants, the algae, and the cyanobacteria. Now, cyanobacteria, again, these are, these are the heroes of tonight's talk. Now, all of these organisms do oxygenic photosynthesis in exactly the same way, but they're not related to one another. If you take, actually, a close look at plant and algal cells, what you see is something like the following. What you're looking at here is the structure of a plant cell. An algal cell would look very similar. Within that cell, there's a chloroplast. The chloroplast, you may remember, is an organelle that's responsible for photosynthesis. So in plants and algae, there is actually a small body that is living within plant and algal cells that's responsible for photosynthesis. Now, the thing that's so interesting here is that if we look at chloroplasts, they have a genome. The nucleus, that also has a genome. So every plant has two genomes. What you're looking at here is a depiction of the chloroplast genome on the left. It's just shown as a circular piece of DNA. And what you can see with each of the colored markers here, those are genes that are present in that genome. Because these genes are present in this genome, we can ask a question about where chloroplasts come from we can examine that gene sequence, its DNA sequence. When you do that exercise, you learn something incredibly interesting. What I'm showing you here is a phylogenetic tree of all of the cyanobacteria. Each of these groups, all these different groups are cyanobacteria. And what you find out is that chloroplasts actually form a clade within the cyanobacteria. So chloroplasts are cyanobacteria. So the way that algae and plants are doing photosynthesis is by borrowing a cyanobacterium. This is a process that we refer to as endosymbiosis, and it is effectively a symbiotic relationship at one point in time between a cyanobacterium and a eukaryote that has effectively gone to completion. The partnership is fully forged, and now cyanobacteria exists solely uh, in, in that case as organelles in plants and algae. Now, so what that means is we need to now ask a question about where cyanobacteria come from. So if eukaryotes, plants and algae, just borrowed a metabolism invented by a bacterium, then where does cyanobacteria come from? If we want to understand where oxygenic photosynthesis comes, comes from, we have to ask a question about the origin of cyanobacteria. Until very recently, we did not have a good answer to this question. And there's actually been a major breakthrough very recently that has come out of genomics that has enabled us to start asking questions about the closest living relatives of cyanobacteria. What I'm showing you right now is a phylogenetic tree, much like the ones I showed you previously, but now it's populated with many different groups or many different taxa. And what you can see here are three main clades, reds, the greens, and the blues. Now, all of those cyanobacteria that we would call are oxygenic, they're the ones that are doing photosynthesis, the ones that you saw on the previous slide, those are here in green. What we now know is that cyanobacteria themselves are derived within a group of non-photosynthetic organisms. Now, many of these different groups, they don't even have names yet. We just know them from genes that were sequenced from the environment. They include such attractive names as MLE135J-21. <laughs> there are some other groups here, in particular the melanobacteria. This is a, a group that was just very recently discovered. They're very closely related to cyanobacteria. The thing that's so interesting about them is that they're incredibly common in the animal gut. We have them inside of us. Okay? In particular, if you eat a lot of vegetables, you've got a lot of them inside of you. What are these organisms doing if they're not doing photosynthesis? Many of them are doing fermentation reactions. 
They're not interested in oxygen. They're not interested in light. They're just kind of hanging out. So now when we think about where cyanobacteria came from, they didn't come from our guts, okay? But they came from a group of organisms that are out there doing relatively simple biochemistry. What we've done is been able to sequence the genomes of a number of these different groups. With those genome sequences, we can start to do interesting things about asking a question about the relative timing of when cyanobacteria appeared. Now, what I'm showing you here is that same phylogeny, except I've added now a couple of other important groups that are closely related to cyanobacteria, in this case, the melanobacteria. And note that this phylogeny, instead of just showing those branch lengths as a function of, say, for example, evolutionary distance, I'm now showing them as a function of age or time. What you're looking at here is the result of a molecular clock. Now, molecular clocks are very elegant, simple tools to try to estimate the divergences between different groups of organisms. And they rely on a really simple principle. That is, when organisms diverge from one another, their gene sequences and their protein sequences begin to accumulate differences. And if they accumulate differences at a given rate, we have a chronometer. Now, in this case, we can't know time independently. The way that we get to know time is we get to count up the differences between those different divergences, and we have to calibrate it with fossils. Now, the thing that's really nice about the cyanobacteria, like I mentioned earlier, is we have all the chloroplasts derived from them. Cyanobacteria themselves do not have a fantastic fossil record, but algae and land plants do. And what that enables us to do is to produce an estimate for when cyanobacteria diverged from those anaerobic ancestors. That, in effect, is an estimate of when oxygenic photosynthesis appeared. What you see here is that there's actually a relatively long branch for when oxygenic photosynthesis appeared, sometime younger than about 2,600 million years ago, and sometime older than about 2.2 billion years ago. Okay? This gives us a window in the back of our head to now go and ask questions about this interval of time, to ask questions about what's going on. How are cyanobacteria, these early versions of, of oxygenic photosynthesis, what does the world look like when these are evolving? The other thing that's really important here is that our planet is exceptionally old, four and a half billion years old. The divergences that you're looking at here are about two and a half billion years old to two billion years old. What that tells us is that oxygenic photosynthesis in the context of our planet's history is a relatively recent invention. That's really interesting to think about. Why does it take so long on our planet Teeming with microbes, we know that life has been around our planet at least for three and a half billion years. Why does it take so long for oxygen photosynthesis to take hold? Now, in order to go a level deeper and ask a question about where oxygenic photosynthesis comes from within the cyanobacteria, I want to do a little bit of a review of what photosynthesis is, and in particular, how some of the machinery at the core of photosynthesis work. What you're looking at here is actually a very simple chemical reaction that describes the photosynthetic process. Here, we take CO2, we take water, we split water, and use the electrons that are on water to reduce CO2 and produce organic compounds. In, in so doing, we produce oxygen by the splitting of water. Now, we might break this process into what you would call the light reactions and the dark reactions. The light reactions are the ones that involve light. The dark ones are the ones that occur independent of light. And we'll divide these up into different, uh, in, into different types of reactions because they involve very different biochemistries, and they have discrete evolutionary histories. What I want to talk about today is the light reactions. So what are the light reactions? Fundamentally, photosynthesis is built around very simple protein machines. What you're looking at here is a cartoon of what we call a photochemical, uh, a photosystem, or a reaction center. We use those terms in, 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 um, interchangeably. These are membrane proteins. You're looking at the cross-section of a cell membrane here, and you can see that they are decorated with molecules of chlorophyll. 
The chlorophyll is the bit that's responsible for absorbing the light and actually act acting, in the case of reaction centers, as a hub for the movement of electrons. Now, what these proteins do is they absorb a photon of light, and they undergo a charge transfer. What that means is that they are simultaneously able to become strongly oxidizing and strongly reducing. Now, this is the trick behind photosynthesis. That strong, electron, uh, that strong oxidant we can feed high potential electrons into, and that strong reductant we can receive low potential electrons from. So fundamentally, photosynthesis is built around these machines that turn high potential electrons into low potential electrons. It's really that simple. Now, the way that we like to express that is instead of just talking about high potential and low potential, we often show the path that those electrons take as a function of their reduction oxidation potential. Okay, now in this case, we have this scale from large negative numbers here to large positive numbers. These positive numbers, those are strong, strongly oxidizing conditions or strong oxidants. These negative numbers are strong reductants. And what the photosystem accomplishes is it takes electrons that are very oxidizing and makes them very reducing, okay? And then, those electrons are able to flow through an electron transport cascade that allows these organisms to generate energy. Now, the next slide shows in gory detail exactly where those electrons will transit, again, as a function of the redox potential. What you can see here in cyanobacteria on the left, and again, cyanobacteria, algae and plants, remember algae just borrow this metabolism from cyanobacteria, and plants are just a group of algae that went on land, okay? So what we're looking at here in cyanobacteria is actually really fascinating. They use two photosystems together, and they have them wired here in series. What that allows them to do is produce strong enough oxidants to be able to oxidize water, while at the same time producing strong enough reductants that they're able to produce reducing power that the cells can use to fix carbon into biomass. Now, what I'm also showing here are two other types of photosystems. These are reaction center two and reaction center one. You don't need to worry about the details here, but these are found present in other groups of bacteria these are groups of bacteria that do what we describe, what we would call anoxygenic photosynthesis. They don't make oxygen. Instead of receiving their electrons from water, they receive their electrons from either iron or reduced sulfur compounds or molecular hydrogen or reduced organic compounds, okay? So they're using similar machines, but they're not using them to split water. I'll mention one more thing, and that is cyanobacteria figure out how to do oxygenic photosynthesis by pulling together these two machines laterally transferred into that group some two and a half billion years ago, okay? So there are two keys here to oxygenic photosynthesis at a molecular level. Coupled photosystems, I won't talk any more about that tonight, Something that I am gonna talk about in some detail is what we call the water oxidizing complex. This is the little bit of chemistry that occurs in photosystem two that allows it to do the water splitting reactions. Now, all those reaction centers do single electron chemistry. Like I said, they absorb a photon of light, they move an electron. That's what they do, absorb a photon of light, they move an electron. If you wanna oxidize water, you can't just do one electron chemistry. Because when we oxidize water, we've gotta do four electron chemistry. What that means is we have to take a machine that is built to do single electron chemistry and adapt it to do the four electron oxidation of water. Now in this way, photosystem two, this is this machine that's only found in cyanobacteria, is special. It has this feature that we call the WOC, the WOC, or the water oxidizing complex. The water oxidizing complex is tremendously unique. It is a bio-inorganic cluster of four manganese atoms, a calcium center, all bound by oxygens. 
What it, what it does is it acts as a sort of redox capacitor that allows us to link the single electron chemistry that the reaction center wants to do with the four electron chemistry needed to split water. And it works like this. We start with the water oxidizing complex. There are those four manganeses. We absorb a photon of light. We move an electron into electron transport. And we increase the formal valence on this complex by one. We do this again. We increase the formal valence by two. We do it again and again and again. And after four cycles, we have effectively completed the catalytic oxidation of two water molecules to produce oxygen. Now, where does the water oxidizing complex come from? I'll tell you right now that there is nothing else in nature like it. When we look at most evolutionary processes as they occur in nature, the role of exaptation is really important. Exaptation is just a way of describing a process of adapting a machine that's built for one purpose for a new one. The water oxidizing complex doesn't work like that. This motif doesn't exist in nature. It is built anew, and so we have to think very hard about where it comes from. There are a number of different ideas that have been posed about where this thing comes from, but we actually have a really powerful idea that is provided by some understanding of how it is made. That is that we were looking at, at some point in time before water splitting, a manganese phototrophy intermediate. And you could broadly describe this process with a chemical reaction that says, we take reduced manganese species, we use light and CO2, we are able to make organic matter, and we make oxidized manganese species. This is an idea we want to test, but I want to show you where the core of this idea comes from and why it's such an, a powerful and important idea. So you might ask, OK, if the water oxidizing complex doesn't look like anything else in nature, how does it, how does it get made? The way that it's made is actually incredibly simple. It's a process called photoassembly. And all the photosystem does is provide a happy environment for manganese to land. And then it just goes about its business of absorbing a photon of light and moving an electron. And what happens, we have manganese 2 comes in. We have one cycle. That manganese stays. We have another manganese that comes in. That manganese stays as, highly, as high valent oxidized manganese species. You do this exercise five times, and now we've arrived at what you would call the basal state of the water oxidizing complex. We are now ready to go and start splitting water. So photoassembly, the way that this is made, actually makes a really important set of predictions. The first, biological water oxidation begins by manganese oxidation. Now, this is a process, this manganese, this photoassembly process, is something that is occurring every 20 minutes in all plants. And that is because this process of splitting water is so chemically difficult that this protein oxidizes itself. And it has to be replaced every 20 minutes. Okay, Every time it's replaced, it is doing manganese oxidation. Now, that photoassembly process makes an evolutionary prediction. Before this protein was able to split water, it was capable of oxidizing manganese. Now, manganese also plays a very special role because of where it sits in redox space. So now you've seen a couple different times this redox tower, again, strong oxidants, strong reductants. If we look at all of those anoxygenic photosynthetic bacteria, here is what their photosystems look like. Here is as oxidizing as they can be. Here is as reducing as they can be. Manganese requires high potential oxidants. In order to oxidize manganese, you have to become a very oxidizing protein. Now, photosystem two, capable of water splitting, is way down here. As you take a machine from here to here, manganese is right on the way. Okay? But manganese makes a set, sets of decisions. Once you start oxidizing manganese, you start exploring chemistry that puts you on a path to water oxidation. Now, manganese is also incredibly special from how we understand the chemistry of what ancient seawater looked like. 
What I'm showing you here is a cartoon cross-section of the concentrations of manganese and iron in seawater greater than two and a half billion years ago. What we recognize is that surface seawater is rich in manganese. Now, the same is not true of iron. Iron is effectively being kept out of surface seawater by other photosynthetic organisms that are using that iron as a source of electrons. There's plenty of manganese in surface seawater. There's plenty of light in surface seawater. There is an evolutionary opportunity for an organism to figure out how to oxidize manganese. Okay? There is an, there's a niche here. So we want to see if and when this niche was exploited. So let me just make this hypothesis totally concrete for you. So we can start with an, an ancestral cyanobacterium. It picks up two photosystems via lateral gene transfer. Those photosystems, they don't produce high enough potential oxidants to oxidize manganese. But then one of them is, is allowed to be somewhat experimental. It develops high potential oxidants, and it starts to be able to oxidize manganese. This is a process that we can recognize in sedimentary rocks because it makes minerals. We'll come back to this. Sometime thereafter, we figure out how to, instead of getting rid of the manganese, retain it behind at the, at the site of the protein, and how to do more complex chemistry. And that allows us, ultimately, to start splitting water and making oxygen. So now, what we have here is a prediction that we can take to the geologic record and test. That prediction says, OK, when we look before oxygen is present in the environment, we should see an interval when manganese is being oxidized and is accumulating in sedimentary rocks. That's now what we're going to turn to do. We're going to turn to the geologic record and ask about whether or not we can, we can find evidence for this process. OK, a quick Earth history orientation. So I mentioned the Earth is very old. So here, four and a half billion years ago, here on the right is today. The advent of plants. Okay. Plants are relatively recent. They're newcomers on the planet. Animals are slightly older. Now, I'll point out here, I like to put this here for some of my, uh, my dear friends and colleagues who study animals. What, what you're looking at down here is the diversity history of animals on the planet. And the teeth there, those are mass extinction events. Now, this is basically inconsequential compared to the amount of time that we're left with here when we really start talking about all the things that transpired prior to the evolution of animals. Yet, this is the time that, uh, of, uh, this is the, the portion of Earth history that we have the best understanding of. A lot of this time, we're just now starting to, to uncover some of these processes. Now, the oldest eukaryote fossils, this is the group that includes plants and animals and, uh, you know, of course, us. Those are middle Proterozoic in age. As we go a little bit older, some of the oldest cyanobacterial fossils are these described from the Belcher Islands in Canada, described by, by Hans Hoffman in the Belcher Islands, Canada. Now, as we go older, in particular, as we step across into the Archean, this interval of time greater than two and a half billion years ago, the body fossil record falls apart. What you're looking at here are uh, at best described as putative Archean microfossils. Okay? And what I hope you can appreciate here is that the questions that we might ask of these features are limited to, are these fossils or not? And how do we know we're not looking at bubbles in a rock and things like that? Right? The level of biological inference that we can make from them is incredibly limited. So how are we going to, so for the time being, the body fossil record actually provides little insight into cyanobacterial origins. So what are we going to do? So if we don't have a great fossil record, what we're going to have to do instead is we're going to have to ask questions about how microbes are influencing the chemistry of their, env their environment, and then look at the chemistry of the environment and use that to invert for microbial processes that are occurring in it. Now, many geological observations indicate that there is a major rise in oxygen in paleoproterozoic time. The reason we're so excited about oxygen, of course, is, well, that's our marker for cyanobacteria, right? So if we can't find fossils for them, let's see if we can find their metabolic products. Now, what you're looking at here is kind of a great divide that effectively describes the timing of the rise of atmospheric oxygen. Now, some of these geological proxies are 
pretty simple to understand. We can look at the behavior of iron in paleosols. Paleosols are just ancient soil horizons. And iron is interesting because if, if the conditions are reducing, iron is soluble. It'll be mobilized from those paleosols. If there's oxygen around, that iron gets oxidized and forms minerals that are kind of akin to things you would recognize as rust. Stays behind, those paleosols are red. It's very easy to recognize. There's another one that we'll come back to. This is redox sensitive detrital grains. These are minerals that are incredibly sensitive to oxygen. If there's oxygen present in the environment, they disappear rapidly via chemical weathering. So we can ask, are they present in the environment as a way of, of as, as, as a kind of barometer for oxygen? Okay, so let's now paint manganese onto this, onto this history. Now, I want to point out here that manganese is a unique proxy for high potential oxidants. In order to oxidize manganese and produce minerals that accumulate in the rock record, we need really oxidizing conditions. We basically need oxygen or species that are derived from oxygen, or we need one of these early photosystems. So let me just describe for you, oh, let me, let me mention, this, a, a lot of what I'm gonna tell you about here for manganese is the, is the work of a PhD student of mine, uh, Jenna Johnson, uh, who I believe is also here tonight uh, and would just be thrilled to answer some questions about manganese <laughs> later. Okay, let me just briefly describe, give you some intuition for what the manganese cycle looks like and why it is a barometer both for oxygen and photosynthesis. Okay, where does manganese come from? Well, all of the manganese that is delivered to rivers and delivered to seawater comes from manganese too in igneous rocks, in the crust. When those minerals get weathered chemically, we end up with soluble manganese that's transported. Now, if there's no oxygen around in that system, that manganese builds up in seawater and it leaves us a trace constituent of carbonate minerals, of carbonate phases. Now, the second you add oxygen in, you now start to have a more complex manganese cycle and two forms of sinks. Here, in this case, we start to have rocks that are rich in manganese oxide phases. So what are the oldest manganese oxide phases? Well, here you're looking at some of them. This is the famous Kalahari manganese field. It's about 2.2 billion years old. And these dark rocks that you're looking at are up to 30 weight percent manganese. They're actually incredibly important deposits. Manganese is critical for, this is, this is ore that's critical for the tempering of steel. So these are actually incredibly economically important deposits. Now those come to here, as I said, about 2.2 billion years ago. This leaves us with a, with a big question mark. Let's go in and look at rocks that were deposited during the time of the question mark and ask in detail what's going on with manganese in the environment. And the question that we want to ask is, can we find the oldest manganese oxides, or at least the oldest instance of when manganese is being oxidized and concentrated in sediments, and then ask, was that due to oxygen in the environment? Or can we rule out oxygen? and leaving us behind with an early form of photosynthesis. The place where we've been doing most of this work is in South Africa. What you're looking at here is the distribution of an ancient craton. This is an ancient continent. And the distribution of the rocks you can see here, in particular, we've been working in the Northern Cape province in something called the Transvaal Supergroup. What you're looking at here is a geologic map of these rocks. And in particular, where we're working out here in this basin, we're looking at a set of materials that were deposited on this continent about 2.4 billion years ago. Now, the way that we access some of these materials is by exploiting deep diamond drilling. And part of the reason for this, you might suspect, just by looking at the color of the soil in this region. The soil's red because the rocks that are underlying it are very rich in iron. Now that iron, when you look in the rocks, is actually reduced, but it becomes oxidized during the production of soil. We can't look at, if we're interested in the redox state of some of the minerals like manganese, uh, of some of the manganese bearing minerals, we need fresh material. We can't have weathered material. And in this case, that demands that we collect drill cores from deep within the earth. Now, what I'm showing you here is a cross-section through this ancient continent with the different rock types shown. And I just want to highlight some of the ages that you're looking at here. 
Now, at the very bottom of this pile of sedimentary rocks, we're about 2.6 billion years old, and there's abundant evidence for no oxygen in the atmosphere at this time. By the time you're looking at the very top of these rocks, now we're looking already at the Kalahari manganese field. We're looking at a world that's full of oxygen. What we're going to look at now are some rocks that were deposited in particular on the edge of the continent in what's, what, what's similar to something like the ancient Mississippi Delta. And, and, and we're going to ask, in this intermediate interval, what's going on with these rocks? Now, I'll tell you right now, these rocks have manganese in them. And it's, and it's completely obvious by looking at outcrops. Because when we look at these outcrops, you see this deep black color that's associated with them. Those are manganese oxides. They are coming from the weathering of manganese-rich rocks. So let, what do some of the drill cores look like? Well, when we look at the drill cores of this group, these are drill cores through something called the Kukas subgroup, you can see here we're showing each of these different drill cores. And alongside, we're showing the manganese content. Now, just for background, I'll tell you that the average manganese content of the crust is about 0.1 weight percent, 0.1 weight percent. What we're looking at here are rocks that are up to 16, 17 weight percent. These rocks are incredibly enriched in manganese. Now, they suggest that in order to get that enriched in manganese, we certainly have to have a redox process, some process that's oxidizing the manganese, the manganese is forming a, a mineral, and it's being concentrated in the sediments. But this is something that we actually have to test up close, and I'll tell you why. Many rocks that are this old have complex histories of mineralization. I've mentioned that sedimentary rocks are great recorders of the environment. They're great recorders of the environment. They're also great recorders as rocks. So they tell you about processes that are going on while, those the, while sediment becomes rock, but they also tell you about processes that went on as, while they were rocks. These could be processes that are altering the chemistry of the rock that happened long after it was deposited. You can imagine starting, for example, with marine mud. That marine mud has a primary manganese oxide phase in it, but it might later have an overgrowth and a replacement that's of a different manganese oxide phase. Later yet, this rock might be fractured, and you might mineralize some manganese-rich phases into a vein. Now, all is not lost because you can note that there are cross-cutting relationships between all these different phases. Because there are cross-cutting relationships, we can tell time as long as we are able to understand the chemistry of this rock at the relevant scales. Now, note that the relevant scales here are in microns. Let me show you what some of these rocks look like. What you're looking at here are SEM images, scanning electron micrographs, of some of these different rocks. And what I hope you can appreciate is they are very fine-grained. And they are full of all kinds of different textures. And each of the different color intensities, the grayscale intensity that you see here, these are pulling out different phases that are variably enriched in iron and manganese. Now, in order to ask a question about what these rocks are doing at a fine scale, we need to ask a question not just of the textures that are present, like you see here. We want information about the redox state of those phases at a very fine scale. The way that we do this is we use synchrotron x-rays to do spectroscopy, in particular, here what you're looking at here is, is the, um, the Stanford synchrotron radiation light source, uh, where we do a lot of our work. And there we use a variety of different beam lines. Those beam lines pr provide exceptionally bright x-rays that allow us to do x-ray absorption spectroscopy of what you might call the k-edge of these different minerals. Now, you don't need to worry about what this is, but let me just tell you that the k-edge structure of three different manganese bearing minerals, a reduced mineral, an oxidized mineral, a kind of mixed valence mineral, uh, changes as a function of the redox state of the material that's in there. Now, we can apply those x-rays to the sample at a variety of different scales. We can do bulk tapes. This is just powder of a rock pressed onto scotch tape. We can also use what you might call an x-ray mesoprobe or an x-ray microprobe and ask questions about the rock by interrogating it with a microfocus beam of x-rays down to the micron scales that are relevant for the phases present in this rock. Now, I'm going to show you some examples of what some of these x-ray images look like. Here's an example from the Kalahari manganese field. What you're looking at is a transmitted light micrograph on the left. And what you can see here is a black rock that's rich in manganese oxides, and then a, these light 
nodules that are in them. Those nodules are composed of, the min of carbonate minerals. What you can see here in the redox map is that we have these oxide phases. In this case, it's, it's mostly a mineral called bronite, a manganese three rich mineral. And those concretions are dominantly a manganese two rich mineral. In this case, it's a mineral called kutnohorite. Now, when we do this exercise looking at all of the different species of manganese that are present in these cores that we're working on, what we don't see is, is any presence of manganese oxide minerals. This is puzzling. We think manganese is being oxidized to concentrate manganese in these environments, but when we go and we look, we don't see oxides. Instead, we find reduced phases that are present. What's going on here? Well, the thing that's really interesting that's going on here is those manganese oxide phases that are being concentrated in the sediment, they're being used as food for microbes on, in this environment that doesn't have any oxygen in it. So like you and I breathe oxygen, we eat organic matter, we breathe oxygen. There are microbes that eat organic matter and instead of breathing oxygen, they breathe oxidized metals manganese oxides, iron oxides. And when we look at all those manganese carbonates, we see that they have classic diagenetic textures associated with them. That just means that they grew in the sediments after the sediments were deposited. When we look at the carbon isotopic composition of those carbonates, it has this really unique fingerprint that tells us that those carbonates were being produced by microorganisms in the sediment that were eating those manganese oxides, they were reducing the manganese, and they were precipitating a manganese carbonate phase. This actually turns out to be an incredibly widespread process. What I'm showing you here is just a smattering of different x-ray images from manganese deposits of all ages. And what you'll see here is that there's this very broad spectrum from very oxidized materials that are young in age to ones that, as they get older, become more and more reduced. What we're seeing here is this process of manganese oxides as good food for microorganisms. So what we have here is a conceptual model for the deposition of manganese-rich sedimentary rocks that begins with a source of manganese-2 in seawater. It's oxidized to manganese oxide phases that get concentrated in the sediments. But those phases are good food for microorganisms that reduce them to produce manganese-2 carbonates. Now, what we want to do now is we want to ask a question in detail about the oxidation process. So now we've found an environment. We've got the oldest manganese oxides in the sediment. What was the process that was responsible for producing those manganese oxides? Was it oxygen? Or was it this manganese oxidizing photosystem? In order to do this, we're going to have to interrogate a different proxy than manganese. And the one that I want to describe is what I view as by far and away the best proxy for oxygen in the environment because we understand the mechanics of how it works in great detail. These are these redox-sensitive detrital grains. So now when we look at minerals like pyrite, FES2, a reduced iron and reduced sulfur-bearing mineral, or minerals like uraninite, a, a, a reduced uranium-bearing mineral, both of these minerals decay very rapidly in the presence of oxygen. They get oxidized. Okay. So what we can do is we can say, well, what's happening to these materials as they're being transported around on the surface of the Earth? If they are moving around just like quartz sand is in rivers, that's telling us that they're not encountering oxygen as they move around on the surface of the Earth. So they are, in effect, offering us an oxygen barometer. Let's see if we can find any of these grains present in our rocks. So you're just looking at one of the drill cores here. We have to look at the drill core that covers shallower rocks because it contains the right lithologies for us to interrogate. And what you're looking at here are a range of different samples that we looked at to see whether or not they have the trital pyrite and uraninite. And sure enough, every single one of these samples has detrital pyrite and or uraninite in them. Here is what some of these minerals look like. And what you can see, if you had, these are all these pyrite minerals. You can see they have nice rounded edges they're present in these sandstones. Here's even a, a uraninite mineral with a little bit of pyrobitumen, organic compound associated with it. Now, one of the things that you might naturally ask is, how much oxygen are we talking about? How much oxygen is required to uh, oxidize these grains? Or how much oxygen must be missing from the atmosphere if we find these grains to, to persist? 
The way that we can answer that is by creating a kinetic transport model that combines chemical and physical abrasion processes. And that actually shows us that detrital pyrite and uraninite is actually incredibly sensitive to oxygen in the environment. We're looking at an environment that has oxygen concentrations that are way less than a ppm. Very, very anoxic environment. So now when we turn to this picture where we have this big question mark, we see that we can overlap these. Manganese is being oxidized in the environment, but those redox sensitive detrital grains tell us that oxygen is not the culprit. There are other proxies that we can apply, independent proxies. There's, there's one that's called multiple sulfur isotopes. I'm not going to get into the details behind how this works, but it provides, again, uh, another very sensitive indicator of oxygen in the environment. And what it shows us is, again, this is an environment that contains very low concentrations of oxygen, way too low to explain the manganese enrichments that we observe. So what we've confirmed, in essence, is this situation. We observe the manganese cycle turning on, we've got manganese oxides, and the culprit appears to be this early photosynthetic process that is not yet splitting water, but is on a path to figuring out how to split water. So comparative biology illustrates that oxygenic photosynthesis is a relatively recent invention. This photo assembly tells us that manganese oxidation was actually a critical intermediate in the development of water splitting. Now, prior to two and a half billion years ago, I haven't talked a lot about iron, but we saw that iron was depleted from the surface oceans. So productivity was electron limited. And if we look at the manganese that's present in surface water, along with the light, it provides some additional context for why nature chose manganese. There's an opportunity there if you can just figure out how to use it. Now, around 2.4 billion years ago, the oxidative side of the manganese cycle switched on. Two independent proxies tell us this wasn't due to O2, and this supports this hypothesis that we developed from comparative biology that single electron oxidation reactions involving manganese formed an evolutionary waypoint in the development of the water oxidizing complex and the evolution of biological water splitting. Now, there are a couple thoughts that I want to leave you with because this isn't the end of the story. After about 2.3 billion years ago, photosynthesis had finally overcome the challenges of figuring out not just how to oxidize manganese, but now how to oxidize manganese and then go on to oxidize water. And that process makes oxygen. That oxygen has a number of really rich cascading effects. So I just want to show you here, this is an example. This, in this case, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a green alga, uh, something called ulva. But what you see, each of these bubbles here, imagine the oxygen production rate that is enabled by these organisms, right? Those bubbles are oxygen that is super, being super saturated in the, in the, in the seawater that these organisms are living in. Now, I want to point out that oxygen itself is a double-edged sword, okay? So here we have this kind of nonplussed cyanobacterium that has just figured out how to split water. That's a wonderful thing because there's a lot of water on the planet. There's a lot of light on the planet, no longer limited by iron or manganese. But now you make oxygen, and oxygen is tremendously corrosive. Oxygen ruins your lipids, oxygen ruins your DNA. So how do you do this process without setting yourself on fire? Okay, that's the challenge here. Now, there are a number of processes that end up challenged by oxygen. Here's a great example. Nitrogen fixation is a process that's required for all these organisms in order to make biomass. We need nitrogen. Nitrogen is about 10% of these cells. And it's done by this, this enzyme here, nitrogenase. Now, nitrogenase was developed in a world where oxygen didn't matter. There wasn't oxygen to contend with. And it uses a number of different iron sulfur clusters that are very sensitive to oxygen. They're, 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 they're in a, inactivated in the presence of oxygen. So now you have this problem. I want to make oxygen, but how am I going to get nitrogen to, in order to fix? So you have to figure out some of these different problems. One of the things that oxygen does allow you to do is aerobic respiration. And this is really another revolution unto itself. Aerobic respiration is like agriculture in that it offers a really rich source of energy. Now, here I have, a, I have a quote from Jared Diamond. You would know him as the author of Guns, Germs, and Steel. All the interesting stuff like technology, writing, and empires requires a productive economy that is producing enough food to feed technological experts, bureaucrats, kings, and scribes. Hunter-gatherer societies don't produce enough food surpluses to support these extra people. Agriculture does. So 
you can imagine, right, you've got, you've got 100 gathers here versus your John Deere 60, 625D Turbo Reaper, right? This is, a, this is a big breakthrough. The ability to stock, stockpile food frees up time, and that frees up time for people to do interesting things. Aerobic respiration does the same thing. Aerobic respiration is, is up to 15 times more efficient than anaerobic metabolisms, and all that extra energy allows you now to do some interesting things. So John mentioned multicellular organisms. Aerobic respiration enables, for the first time, organisms to express their behavior not just through chemistry, not just through their metabolism, but through morphology. And what we know is that complex multicellularity has evolved many different times. Here are three groups that you would know well, the fungi, the animals, the plants. These are all aerobic organisms. By breathing oxygen and, and, and the, the surplus energy that comes along with that metabolism, we're able to have a planet with bears. OK, once oxygenic photosynthesis evolved, oxygen has also been a, an important component of our atmosphere for the past two billion years. Two billion years. I'll mention that oxygen is incredibly dynamic in the atmosphere. It's constantly being consumed. It's constantly being produced. That two billion year time frame now allows us to think about what about these other planets that exist outside our solar system? These planets that are in many ways Earth-like. These planets that in the next 10 years we're going to start to get information about the composition of their atmospheres. Oxygen is one of these things that we're going to be looking for. We're going to be very interested to see how many planets out there have oxygen, how many planets are like us, and is it possible that those planets developed an oxygenated atmosphere through a similar process that, that brought oxygen to our planet. Now finally, I'll just end by talking about prospects for solar fuels. Now, this is, a, this is a major effort at, at Caltech taking place in chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, the basic idea is, can we figure out how to do the water splitting process in a way that is as efficient or better than what plants are doing? And for some of us that study evolutionary history, it's kind of like, wow, gosh, there's, you know, nature took a lot of time to figure this process out, and really you think you're going to do, you know, nature took two billion years, you think you're going to do better in a, in a couple decades? But keep in mind that all of the plants out there are using technology to split water that's two and a half billion years old. Now me, I'm still proud I'm on a generation one iPad, but I'm thinking about switching relatively soon, okay? So I think that, in, in terms of how we think about this process, we can maybe free up some of these constraints, and we can really start thinking about doing things that are different than what plants are trying to do. So I guess what I would like to do is end there. If you have any questions, uh, I, would, I would be happy to address them. Uh, maybe we'll address them at the front um, shortly. Thank you. <laughs>